yeah, so, I mean, let me remind you at least a, a bit of the notation we were using uh, last time. So, um, so I was using uh, rangy divergences between measures, the lambda variables. Um, and rangy divergences are just a generalization of uh, the Kulbach Leibler divergence, which is nevertheless useful to get tighter guarantees of, uh, um, of uh, distinguishing common random variables. So, mu, mu, alpha, d, That's the definition, um, and the point is that at the limit where alpha tends to one, this uh, alpha rangy divergence uh, becomes a chaos divergence. So in particular, the arguments I was making last time about uh, mixing times and whatnot uh, were based on properties that I stated for the chaos divergence, but they can readily be generalized for for Rengi, and that's, that, that might be useful for other reasons. Like in particular, these guys who wrote this paper are, are work on, on privacy, and then it's important to control Rengi divergences of certain order. Um, so this is the paper that you sent us, right? The, uh, yeah, the Altschuler Tal work, and there's also the video from, from last time. Uh, there's, there's two technical lemmas that, that are used behind this privacy simplification by iteration result. Um, one that I already proved last time is this contraction reduction lemma. Which states that um, if you have a mapping, um, which is uh, C contracted, meaning C Lipschitz, okay, with Z between, C between zero and one. Uh, you have that um, the alpha divergence of Z times C of um, the push forward measure between mu and mu through T uh, can be upper bounded by the shifted uh, Rangi divergence. So the point here is, how much do we gain? Because uh, we know that when we're going through a non-expansive or contractive mapping, we're certainly not increasing the, the um, rangy divergence because of the uh, data processing inequality. But the fact that this thing is contracted gives you some gain here, which is exactly quantified by this contraction factor. So that we prove, and non-expansive Mappings are important because it turns out that stochastic gradient descent has exactly that feature. When we choose the step size sufficiently small, we get a mapping which is non-expansive. So that should help us for mixing. And that's probably why we need the step values, right? You always have to change the parameter. Otherwise, so that probably doesn't follow the KN that much. Uh, I mean, if you take limits with alpha tending to one, you should be able to get the same conclusion for the KL divergence, but the shifted KL, oh, sorry. I didn't define the shifted, uh, shifted uh, rangy divergence. So, yeah, when, when I would be taking the limit of alpha tending to one, I would get a conclusion for the shifted KL divergence, which I will define right next. Uh, so, this is uh, some sort of regularization of these either KL or, or, or rangy divergences uh, based on, on, on allowing you to relax the distance by using transports. So, um, this is gonna be the maximum between um, mu comma, uh, sorry, mu prime such that the Wasserstein infinity between mu and mu prime is at most z of the um, alpha rangy divergence between mu prime and mu. 
So you relax the notion of the because, for instance, if these two measures have this turn to support, the Renyi divergence is going to be infinite, right? Because of these probability ratios we need. Uh, yet with this, you're allowing transports of certain magnitude, right? So, so for instance, the arguments we used last time uh, started with a like sort of a maximal possible transport, which is just the diameter of the set, and then we. The, the kind of inductive argument is, is basically shifting transports into uh, into the divergence through these kind of improvements of the of these shifted divergences. Okay, so that's one lemma, which, as I said, impacts the kind of the uh, what happens after going through a gradient step. And the second one, it's uh, this shift reduction lemma. which quantifies the gains that you obtain through convolution with a Gaussian curve. So, Let me remark here that, I mean, there's alpha and there's A, right? So be careful. Here's A and here's A. And A is, is an extra parameter which you can choose at your will, OK? So what does it say? I mean, it says, suppose that you start with certain guarantees for like a larger shifted Renyi divergence between mu and mu. After Gaussian convolution, you can get a tighter shift at the cost of using that shift here uh, in this term. And this term, I mean, if you have two Gaussians with means which are uh, separated by A, uh, this is what the tail divergence is going to give you. So I need to generalize this for um, Renyi divergence. So I wrote this incorrectly. Um, sorry, I need to find, ah, yeah, but it's easy to fix it. So. If you want to get this guarantee for alpha Renyi divergence, you just need to multiply here by alpha. So, uh, yeah, so it allows you to basically um, get tighter shifts after Gaussian convolution at the cost of this term. Okay, and yeah, this proof is a bit longer than, than the other one, so I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take, but let, let's see. So, or maybe just for the sake of time, let me do the proof for the case uh, where z is equal to zero. The other one kind of reduces to this one, and I think it already explains most of the ideas. Okay, so let's let's do this one, but you can you can check on the paper the generalization is not much hard. Okay, so as we did with the other contraction reduction lemma, we'll first consider a measure mu prime that kind of realizes this shifted Renyi divergence. Or not, not exactly, but it, it realizes the shifted Renyi divergence with parameter A instead of Z plus A. Okay, so we'll start with by definition of uh, shifted Renyi divergence, okay? Uh, there exists mu prime, a measure such that the infinity Wasser Stein distance between mu and mu prime is at most A. And the alpha Renyi divergence between mu prime and mu is at most uh, this. Just, I'm just saying, by definition, there is a shift, right, in Wasser Stein metric that allows you to get um, Renyi divergence of order of at most this, okay? And in particular, because of this, we have a coupling between these two, right? So, okay, it's a 
coupling of between mu and mu prime that has this property that the random variable w that I will define as u minus mu prime is almost surely upper bounded by, um, sorry, let me say just norm because we're working in a certain norm in a finite dimensional space, uh, is at most a almost surely. So those are the preliminaries we need to then do the argument. Uh, so any questions about this? Clear? Okay. All right. So now I want to upper bound the shifted rangy divergence of uh, A. Zero, yeah, yeah. We have on the on the left we have just zero, which is which is just the rangy divergence. Okay, so we want to get a bound on the rangy divergence between mu convolved with a Gaussian uh, against this mu convolved with a Gaussian. Okay. Um, and what we will do is, is we will transform this mu into mu prime by, let me say, ah, sorry, uh, just I, I'm shifting the mean from zero to w, and then. And then here I have exactly the same, so it's standard normal. Uh, okay, now I need to use an additional lemma that I will just state. Um, maybe we can prove it if we want, but I, I think it's quite intuitive. Um, so let's say that you have x, y, x prime, y prime uh, with x prime independent of y prime, then the divergence between x plus y with x prime plus y prime prime is less than or equal than the divergence between these two, x with x prime, plus the supremum over shifts x. Okay, so this is a this is a not capital, just small x of the uh, alpha rangy divergence between y condition on x equals x with uh, y prime. Okay, so how are we gonna apply this lemma? Okay, wh what does this lemma say anyways, right? So if we want to understand the divergence between the sum of the two and these two are independent, you can kind of condition on the realization, kind of the respective realization of Yeah, okay, so maybe maybe as a starter, right? What happens if these two are independent and these two are independent, then you can use um, the chain rule to basically split these divergences between the divergence between the y's and the divergence between the x's, okay? So um, this is a generalization because yeah, we allow these two to not necessarily be independent, but uh, let's see, in this case, in this case, they actually are, so maybe there's not even need to, to go this far. Uh, but anyways, the, the point I wanna make is, okay, now we have also sums of random variables. These two are independent from each other, so I can use this lemma. And if I use this lemma, I will get Uh, an upper bound with the alpha rangy divergence between mu prime and mu, which we have an upper bound due to that, right? Plus 
the supremum over what? I mean, here we have two Gaussians and one has a mean which is random. So it's effectively over the support of this doubly random variable, or if you want, you can just put it like this, like small w of the alpha divergence between um, this Gaussian and this Gaussian, right? So. in these dimensions, but okay. And this thing has an, a closed form solution, which is just it's going to be alpha times norm of w squared divided by two sigma squared. And w we said is almost surely upper bounded by a, so we can replace this by a squared. And that's that. I think that gives exactly the formula that we have over there. Oh. Well, this thing would be now replaced by, we just let mu, and then we afford a shift here of uh, A, right? Because of this property over here. Uh, so that gives inequality with Z being equal to zero. I'm, I'm not going to prove this lemma because it's mostly algebra. Uh, yeah. The, the definition of that Chagall value conditional on x is equal to x, you mean the definition there is take the corresponding condition and measure something like that? Yes, right? yes, that, that's what we need. But in this case, conditioning on this w is just, uh, we know that it's almost surely bounded by something. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, but that's it. I mean, okay. There's the, the case of z larger than zero, as I said, but then with these two, uh, if you want to see a very easy proof of mixing, you can you can just follow what they do in the paper. Okay, and uh, then I'm probably going to start with the next uh, result. Yes, yes. So so what they do in the paper is you have these two lemmas: the contraction reduction and the shift reduction. And then you can use them kind of in a, in a composed fashion, right? Because I, we know that Langevin uh, Monte Carlo is a, is a composition of these two operations. Okay. First, you take gradient descent steps, then you take convolution with Gaussian steps. Okay. So, and, and as you proceed inductively, what you're basically, you, you start with a shift here, which is the diameter of the set. You can get around the finite diameter assumption as well. They discuss it in the paper. And you start basically shifting those things. So you're getting tighter and tighter rangy shifts, but then you're kind of pushing them to this additive. So you're gonna get term. such a return mixing time. You're gonna get in the end a mixing time, which here is just gonna give you the Wasserstein. I mean, it's gonna give you zero because you're gonna get, you're, you will be allowing shifts which are as large as the diameter of the set. Okay. And here you will get an alpha divergence right, right. guarantee. So that that's, and you can either do this by taking your iterations and the stationary distribution that will give you convergence. Yeah. But you can also get guarantees for mixing times in the sense that you can initialize at two arbitrary points and you can show they also converge to each other. Just like, uh, like consistency. Right, right. But what I mean is like, uh, I, I don't know what's your take on this, but my understanding is that mixing times are related to the fact that you might initialize the chain in arbitrary states, and they kind of converge to the same distribution. Not just like from any starting point, I converge to the stationary, but even if I, like, yeah. even if I do different initializations, they also converge to each other. Right? Yeah. Um, you said you talk about mixing times for your Gordic Markov process. Then Gordic Markov process have a unique mixing distribution. Like they do. They in do. Any case, yeah. they just. I don't know, they just abandon the assumption of specificity and that's why they do that. They don't show that the convergence is independent of the initial condition of time. So, uh, yes, yeah. yes. You want to make this this uh, this convergence guarantees independent of the initialization. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe if you have warm starts, for instance, you can you can say more precise things. Should I this measure as uh, as stationary measure this this one that we ran to sample from, but uh, we can implement this, this Langevin fusion. So we make a discretization of this uh, through this Langevin Monte Carlo or Langevin algorithm. 
uh, and a discretization through a step size ETA. And this discretization looks like this. The problem is that this uh, discretization, the, the discretization has another stationary distribution that we call pi eta. Um, yeah, in general, pi eta is distinct from pi from O. Uh, yeah, so uh, the distribution pi is is fairly well understood when we have some hypothesis on the potential f. For example, when uh, we have smoothness and a strong convexity on the potential f, uh, we have that the measure pi e satisfies a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. And when uh, we only have a smoothness in the potential, we have that the potential pi has uh, satisfies a Poincaré inequality. And so the question is, what uh, what satisfies this this another this other measure pi eta? Uh, so yeah, that, that is a question. And in the motivation of this paper, this 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 is not answered. But I think that in a recent version of a paper by Wilson and Bernbala, uh, it is proved that if you have that the potential is smooth and strong and strongly convex then you have that the distribution pi eta satisfies logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So uh, this is a possible question, but the paper that does not address this question, the paper uh, address this other question. Uh, that if we have a smoothness and a strong convexity for the potential, we have sub-Gaussian concentration for the measure pi. And if we have only smoothness, we have sub-exponential concentration on the measure pi. So the paper asks itself, uh, what do we have when we have this hypothesis? What do we have for the uh, measure pi eta? Uh, so the paper answers these questions, uh, telling us that if you have a smoothness and a strong convexity, you have indeed a sub-Gaussian concentration for pi eta. And if you only have a smoothness, then you have a sub-exponential concentration for pi eta. So these, these two properties are analogous for the two measures. Um, yeah, this result is, it is <coughs> useful in some context. For example, uh, the paper that Cristobal has presented, uh, it is it is focused on the, the constraint case. So you can use this concentration results to pass from the constraint case to the unconstrained, unconstrained case. Because uh, when you have some concentration, you can say that, well, all of your information is in some ball or some radius. And all of, uh, outside, outside it, 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 there is uh, um, not very much information. So yeah, this this result can can serve to generalize this another result. Um, okay, uh, about the assumptions that are made in this paper are that uh, the potential function f is always convex. The potential is always m smooth, big M smooth. Uh, the potential has a minimizer, x star, and we can always assume that x star is zero by that shifting. And also, that there exists some radius r that for all points uh, at distant, as at distant at least uh, r from the minimizer, you have that the uh, function on these points are greater than the minimizer. So, yeah, you, you can't have a, a constant functions for uh, obvious reason. You, you can't, you, you don't satisfy the iterability condition uh, if you have a constant function, for instance. Uh, yeah, uh, this last hypothesis is in fact related to that, to an iterability condition that you always need that this uh, integral. That is the normalization constant in it. 
to the thing. So this last uh, hypothesis is related to that. I think that is a sufficient condition. I don't know if it is necessary. Is that, yeah. Uh, well, and sometimes we also assume that uh, the potential function is m strongly convex, little m. Uh, yeah. So we separate our results. First, we we work on the strongly uh, strongly convex uh, case. In that case, we have a sub Gaussian concentration, and then we drop this hypothesis, and we have that the we have sub exponential concentration. Okay. Um, in order to prove at least the um, the sub Gaussian concentration, we are going to use uh, an argument of this type. Uh, we have this proposition that says that if we have a random vector, this random vector has moment generating function that is bounded, then we can have a sub Gaussian concentration. concentration bound. So the idea from the, for the proof of the sub Gaussian concentra concentration bound is that we try to bound some moment generating is not exactly the moment generating function of the distribution we are interested in, but it is related to that. It's a simplified version of that. From bounded? Yeah. Do you need to subtract the mean of x in the MDF? Uh, I or think do you that, think that the mean is zero? I think that at least to obtain this bound is not needed that the mean is zero. I, I think that with a Chernoff uh, type argument, you always can obtain this result, even if the mean is not zero. No, but then I think that you will get on the right a term that depends on the mean, ah. uh, um, like a shift, right? Yeah. Because you, and uh, in the end, I mean, what you want to prove is, is, is an upper bound on the, on the norm of x, right? So I guess you're kind of implicitly assuming that it's centered. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily, I agree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is not addressed in the paper. I. Okay. But, but yeah. the proof works. <laughs> I, mean, uh, yeah, I mean, they they appear and they did, do not state this result explicitly. They bound the moment generating function and said, well, we have a concentration bound for this. Ah, so, uh, yeah, I assume that this is the, the reason. But yeah, let, let me say this. So, for instance, maybe if you if they prove this bound on the MDF with a certain constant. That constant maybe is absorbed in the dependence on the mean. Maybe, Ma maybe. Or no, I, I think if you be exponential, in, it's going to be like an exponential of lambda. It's still going to be kind of lambda. It, it, it should be like e lambda mu, maybe negative. But anyway, yeah, uh, no. yeah. Uh, this is not addressed. Like oh wait, sorry, sorry. You're doing this for every unit vector. Yeah, I was thinking on arbitrary vectors. If if you normalize by the unit ball, maybe you can absorb it in a constant. I, I don't know really, but <laughs> no, I think so. I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it is for unit vectors because we, because we have a key here in this way, lambda. Okay. Um, yeah. So we could use not to zero, zero mean, this will not hold. I think that if you want to do this for every mu also, in, in the whole space, there's no way you can write this upper bound. Less weaker than a constant time vector, right? Because mm. then mm. the constant times, uh, because then, uh, so basically, the idea is that if you have a sub exponential on part that you shift it, then it's all, it's all, it's also sub exponential, but the constant is the same. So then it's all, uh, okay, right? So the shift is the sub exponential, sub exponential. So essentially, uh, that's. So if you don't shift, you, you, you can absorb it on constant. I, I so the idea is that if it is sub exponential but it's simply it's some mean mu, all right? It will still have the correct case as a product of it, right? But of course the constant will be different, right? Because you have to do the shifting, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, but but it will not be it will be some less weaker than a constant times some constant k times exponential or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that constant will be due to some constant that it will be there, there will be some shift in the exponent or whatever. Yeah. Right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. E to the lambda con constant e to the lambda times e to the lambda squared. 
So let me, let me rephrase that for you. You can define separation for a nodal space. There's a nodal node, <laughs> right? And so you can prove that the orbit node of random variable minus is new. Ever new, simply random variable. Is less or equal than the orbit norm of x. The orbit, the orbit norm of x minus mu is less or equal than the orbit yeah. constant k times the orbit norm of x. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so every c is still in the same sub Gaussian space, and then you have some constant in the response uh, sub gamma. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a good point. Thank you. Uh, but this is true because it's uh, automatically it's very new. I mean, we'll have to see how the proof goes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the proposition is true, I think. I know the proposition is true. I, 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 I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. In that case, uh, the <laughs> there is a no. other. There is an issue in the in the proof, but not here. Okay. They, I, I, uh, I mean, they state something that it is false. It, it is clearly clearly false, but maybe. Uh, it's just that it's a bit sloppy the way they write it uh, mm -hmm. to conclude the end. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can discuss that yeah. later. Yeah, it's, it, it was clear from the proof. Uh, so uh, let us take the, the, the theorems. We have first the um, supergaussianity concentration for strongly convex potentials. And well, the theorem says that, well, suppose that we have an M strongly convex potential and an M smooth, uh, M strongly and M smooth potential. Um, and consider running the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm with a step size strictly less than two over M. Then we have that the stationary distribution satisfies this concentration inequality, where here, here appears um, uh, Const, uh, constant C, that is some kind of con contraction factor, that is defined in this way. Uh, so, uh, first, a remark, this constant C is, well, is in fact a contraction factor uh, because of the, the way that we choose the step size implies that C is always uh, less, uh, strictly less than one. And second, if we, uh, the theorem states uh, the concentration bound for eta strictly less than two over m. If we replace and we only choose uh, the step size less or equal than one over m, then the factor C is, well, can be written in that way. And the concentration bounds uh, simplifies to this. Well, uh, when uh, this little m from there is the uh, strongly convex. Uh, okay. Now let's state the theorem for the, the smooth potentials. So uh, the, this theorem says that um, if we run the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm on a convex and m smooth potential f with a step size less or equal than one over m, then uh, there exist uh, uh, constants a, c, and r greater than zero, such that such that the following concentration uh, bound, uh, inequality holds. So r, r should depend on the dimension, though, right? Or no? The uh, these constants? R, yeah, r. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think they, they depend on on the function, the step size. And the constant r, al at least, depends on the dimension. Okay. Uh, but they are not explicitly uh, stated in the, I mean, they are explicitly, explicitly stated, but in terms of another constants that are not uh, explicitly stated. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, I, I think that, uh, well, some remarks is that, yeah, what I said uh, recently. And also that we don't have a, a how to quantify these constants. I, I think that this is a drawback, I, I don't know. Mm. It is not so clear. I mean, in the previous result, there was a direct dependence, right, on that case yeah. you go back yeah. to the square root of, uh, the yeah. 
Step size. We we don't have the step size here. So, yeah. And in the, the other, the step exponential, uh, yeah, the constant. Uh, the mm -hmm. Computer. Yes. You said that an hypothesis is that the function is higher than a number that you can add. And you have the same idea. Yeah. No, but here you are using that uh, assumption. Um. You know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Right. we need we need a, a hypothesis. I, we need it's not a hypothesis, but it is proved that yeah, if we are from some distance r, something happens. We have a exponential growth and on some function that helps to prove this this theorem. So that's that's a concentration gem. Right? It's basically like as soon as you, it's a deviation gem. As soon as you start deviating from the ball, yeah. going away from the ball, then you start decreasing because um, it's logarithm. So if you replace the logarithm and you the logarithm in favor of the delta, and you write it as um, you write some I don't know. So basically, you will get the e to the minus something squared from the outside if you replace if you if you just make the change of values here. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the perturbation, that's why you call it sub Gaussian, right? If you look at the perturbation from the radius of um, from the sphere of radius r. So the, the prototypical example here is if you look at Gaussians, right, instead of sub Gaussians. If you look at Gaussians, then the result is as, as the dimension increases, the Gaussian will be concentrated on the, uh, you have an upper and lower bound, and the Gaussian will be concentrated, the mass of the, pro the prototypical mass of the Gaussian will be concentrated on a torus around the sphere of radius square root of n, n being the dimension, mm -hmm. right? So here, he generalizes with sub Gaussians and he gets only the lower bound that you, you know, as you basically it's concentrated in the sphere, not on the surface of the sphere, but in the sphere. Mm -hmm. And he says, if I perturb outside that sphere of radius R, R that's a constant times logarithm of phi over delta over there, right? Um, then that will be the gain. So I don't, I'm a little bit confused how they, they write it actually, because I would expect to see R plus delta less or equal than e to the minus constant times e to the minus delta squared. That's what sub Gaussian would mean. But this is the sub exponential. Oh, it's the sub exponential, okay. Yeah, yeah. that means sub Gaussian means plus. Uh, the, the other question I guess is what, what you just said, Santos, right? So uh, for, for Gaussians, you do have this thin shell property. It's not just that outside things are very unlikely to happen, but also inside. Right. right. Um, but they only prove like the outer. Yeah, oh. yeah but that's, I think that's the sub Gaussian usually. You cannot, it's not really something to make a lower bound. Because some ah, so you, you, you use use an MDF to prove both sides of the uh, property? For Gaussian or for sub Gaussian? Uh, you mean sub Gaussian, sorry. Well, sub Gaussian, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in that, but I think mm -hmm. usually for sub Gaussian, they get results of the form outside the ball, deviation of both from outside the ball. I don't know. Yeah, no, actually, I, what, yeah. what I was going to say is like, it's not li like the inner uh, bounds of deviation are also kind of non trivial. So they hold for Gaussians. But I don't know to which extent, and there's some other problems and conjectures that actually relate to that. So. But if you don't assume anything, it's the Gaussian is only at infinity. Yeah. The sub Gaussian hypothesis only is don't get infinity. Right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't remember exactly, but I think, for instance, if you can prove that for every sub Gaussian random variable, you do have this thin shell property that you have like deviations from a certain sphere. Are exponentially decreasing. Yeah, that's like a major question in on the geometry for instance. Okay. So anyway, um, okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not an expert either, but I remember some discussions about that. It's like a subtle matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's go to to the proofs of, of these theorems. Uh, in order to prove the, these theorems, we are going to need this Lyapunov function that we define as, well, for all possible dimensions in the natural numbers, all possible weights, lambdas that are greater than zero, we have, uh, we define this Lyapunov function phi, big phi, uh, of x as the expected value um, 
So e to the lambda inner product uh, between b and x, where this the this notation here denotes that um, we are taking um, the vectors on the unit sphere uniformly as random. So, uh, well, we have several properties for this Diagonal function. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The first property is that this diagonal function is invariant under rotations. So if we plug some rotation here in the argument, uh, well, this rotation will appear here in the, in the inner product. And because of the properties of the rotations on the inner product, uh, this is going to pass in the, uh, in the first slot as the adjoint, and the adjoint is also a rotation. So you have an, an uniform, a uniform uh, unit vector, uh, well, a rotation, a rotation times a uniform unit vector, and this is also uniform. So we separate uniformly, right, from the sphere? Yeah, right. uniform. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, that's the notation will always uh, denote uniform. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is the first property. And, well, this implies that be, since it is invariant under rotations, um, the only thing that matters for this diagonal function, the only thing of, of x that sees this diagonal function is its norm. So this diagonal function is in fact um, equal to a univariate fu a function that we call little phi that depends in, in lambda and the norm of x. And well, we can explicitly write this, this little phi function as this expression from here. So we have replaced here um, um, x, we have repla replaced x by the first canonical vector. So we can always, uh, because it's rotation invariant, you can always choose the first canonical vector and relate to the vector of x. Okay. Uh, second property is that uh, this Lyapunov function, the, uh, no, this little phi function can be written in this way, uh, where here we have the gamma function uh, and we have here the Bessel function. I'm not really sure how, how they prove that and they, they write, write it down. Uh, yeah, in fact, I think that they, they cite some uh, something, something like that, like a Wolfram, <laughs> a Wolfram sketch. Uh, yeah, and here the alpha is d minus 2 over 2. Um, yeah, this, this property from here is, uh, is not used, uh, I mean, it is only used for, for um, proving that um, the little phi function have an, exp an exponential growth after some, some, yeah. Well, also, I mean, you're defining this for a vector, right? X, say. Yeah, uh, the diagonal function, yeah. Uh, but uh, this is univariate, this is in the But I, I, I try to get, you know, to, to the point, right? So you want to control this function for X sampled from your distribution, I guess, right? So that X is gonna be drawn and you wanna understand the diagonal function for random X. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the arguments are are simpler if we we make some symmetrized version of this x because you have, for example, you will have monotonicity from this little phi function. So analysis is simpler. Okay. Uh, yeah. This. Uh, ah. Yeah. This. Third uh, property is that, well, if you if you add some uh, Gaussian noise to the x and you take uh, the expectation of this, of the Lyapunov function, you can in, in a way factor out this uh, Gaussian noise out, and you have only the Lyapunov function of x on the right side. This is relevant because, um, well, uh, you can think. The um, Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm as a two-step uh, uh, iteration, as a two-step iteration. 
the first step is uh, creating the scent, and the second is uh, noise addition. So yeah, this is important. And in this property is that we have a, a little bit of help. Because this is true in expectation, is is sometimes easy to see that it's true in expectation, but they use it without expectation in some part of the property. Um, yeah. Fourth property, well, little pi is positive and increasing on the positive numbers. Yeah, and that is that is positive is easy to see. Um, and that is increasing uh, I think that is enough to take the derivative of this, and yeah, that is, yeah, the derivative should be, yes, in, in fact, greater than zero, I think. So I think that this is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, fifth property is that um, there exists some R0, some constant R0, that depends on D, such that for all R that is greater than R0, we have that the little pi function has expo exponential growth. And um, yeah, this, this R0 depends on D because the little pi function, is, well, you, you can see here that it depends on D through alpha. So yeah, you need, you need this dependence. It is not quantified this dependence. I, I don't know. It, it is stated that uh, it happens from some constant, but yeah. I think you can define it, but. <laughs> I, I, I think that it is in, in a way important, at, at, at least from their analysis, because uh, the sub-exponential uh, concentration, well, you have these this constants, and the, well, some, one of the constants depends on these R0. So, if you want to follow this analysis, you should do it. Uh, yeah, here uh, I forgot to add uh, uh, another property that is useful. Uh, is that, well, the Lyapunov function. Well, uh, it is written by definition by this expectation. function and you can think this uh, Lyapunov function as instead of an expectation over the, the vectors of the unit sphere you can think of it as the expectation of uh, over the random rotations So this is relevant for because we want to bound. Um, we want to bound. I don't. We really want to bound is um, this expectation. The expectation over pi theta of expectation over the random rotations of this. Because this, this 